So good afternoon or good morning, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, so this is going to be our panel about Cloud Foundry community. And in particular, it's about the Cloud Foundry meetup community, which is a very strong part of our community. There are 176 meetups last time I looked. I think there's more now around the world. Um, I thought about send, starting one in Antarctica just so we could say there was one in every continent. Um, I have a friend that goes down there once a year. But it's a very diverse community. It's run by a lot of different people from lots of different organizations. Um, we're going to share best practices. As you'll see, the best practices vary. So you should, in your own meetup or your own community, um, you should take the best ideas here and try them out at home. Um, so first, show of hands before we get started, how many people here have been to a meetup, any kind of meetup? Awesome, about two thirds, maybe three quarters. How many people have been to a Cloud Foundry meetup where the topic was about Cloud Foundry? Wow, just a handful. And how many people actually organize a meetup? So you are a meetup organizer. Awesome. So all of you, whether you've not attended one, whether you've attended one, whether you've organized one of your own, uh, please feel to free to jump in with your own ideas. So if you have questions or if you have insights or you know, we answered the question with how the best way to do something is and you have yet another way, um, feel free to jump in and share that. Um, so with that, we have three meetup organizers who've done an awesome job in their communities. And so we have them here to share what's worked for them, um, what they recommend doing, what they like about it, why they do it. And so I'm going to have them introduce themselves to start. And I think, Kim, you are first. Hi, I'm Kim Bannerman. I am the uh, Director of Technical Advocacy at IBM. And I started the meetup group in Seattle in 2014 and the meetup group in Atlanta, Georgia in 2014 as well. And I've been organizing meetups since 2010. Awesome. Thank you. Lucas. Oh, Paula. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Paula. Hi, I'm Paula Kennedy. I am the Director for Business Operations for Pivotal EMEA. So I'm based in the London office of Pivotal. I used to run a, a company called Cloud Credo, which I founded in 2012 with Colin Humphreys. Um, and when we were kind of within Cloud Credo, we started our own meetup group, which was the London Platform as a Service user group, um, which we founded in 2012 as well, and we still run it today. Thank you. Alex. Yeah, my name is Lucas Leon. I'm with Swisscom. I'm a product owner of our application cloud. That's our platform as a service offering. And we founded the Cloud Foundry Meetup user group for the DACH region in 2014, right after the Cloud Foundry Summit in San Francisco. And I'm mainly organizing meetups within Switzerland. Great. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Stormy Peters. Um, I used to run developer relations for the foundation. Now I'm volunteering in this role. I'm still working primarily on Cloud Foundry ambassadors. Um, I haven't organized a meetup. I go to my local meetup. I haven't organized a meetup, but I used to offer to send t-shirts or swag or anything any meetup organizer wanted. So. I, I can't send you that swag, but I can find someone who can if you need it for your local meetup. Um, so with that, I thought we'd just start with some questions. Um, and just kind of the, the easy one to start, like what works really well in your community? What, what do you think your community, your meetup does particularly well um, that if you were going to give one piece of advice to someone starting a meetup or someone trying to revamp their meetup, what would that be? And read to anyone. Okay, I guess I'll start. Um, so my meetup is slightly different from some of the other meetups you described. So ours is the platform as a service kind of user group. So we're not just focused on Cloud Foundry, although admittedly we're slightly biased and we have a lot of Cloud Foundry based talks. Um, I think the thing that I have found that works well for us is we are we try to be consistent with when we have our meetup and we try to schedule it regularly. So people in our community kind of expect that we'll have a meetup towards the end of the month, normally on a Thursday, and we try to have one a month. And it's typically in the same location. So we run it in the Pivotal office. Um, and I think having that consistency, it's sort of on the calendar. And I've had a few, a few cases where I've had to book it on a different day because a speaker couldn't come. And then someone will say to me, well, why did you change it to Monday? Because it's always on a Thursday. And they sort of have it in their mind that that's when it is. And I think by having it regularly and in the back of people's minds, that way we get more people coming because they, they sort of know when they expect it to happen. Yeah, what works particularly well within our meetup group is the content. It's 
really really about the content if you if we have a meet about micro a meetup about microservices or docker then we have a may way more people in where it's just a random cloud foundry topic so we really see that people check out the schedule and check what speaker is there and what the topic is that there is RSVP. So we really take care of the content there. And what are what are the Cloud Foundry topics that are really interesting? So are they interested in Docker as a competitor? Are there are they interested in hearing how customers use Cloud Foundry or Exactly it's like how can I use Docker on Cloud Foundry? What are my restrictions? Or also how do I need to design my application that it works on Cloud Foundry? And what is also a very important point is to get the lessons learned from other customers or other users from Cloud Foundry. It's like, what was your experience with WIF? Where did you struggle? What can we do to avoid struggling so that they really can profit from it? Cool. Yeah, early on when we were just getting off the ground, it was helpful for us to, to cross post with other meetup organizers. And so I encourage if you're organizing something or you're thinking of it to get to know all the other meetup group organizers and applicable technologies. So example for us was DevOps and Docker and a couple other different topics that played really well with Cloud Foundry. And so that's how we got our attendee base kind of going. And so then people are starting starting anything, always go out and look for advice. And I'm sure when you started out, if you asked, you got tons of advice. And the world changes and different communities are different and different things work. I was curious, what's the best advice you got that didn't work? Like, I know you said, like, Docker's not a hot topic in Seattle as much anymore. Like, what's, what's the piece of advice you got when you started that sounded great and it just didn't work for you? <laughs> so when, when we founded Cloud Credo, and a piece of advice that I was given was, if you run a meetup, it's a great place to recruit new people. It's a, like a, you know, a recruitment kind of hotbed of developers. We never, in the history of Cloud Creator, hired one person through our meetup group. And it was one of those things where, like, I really enjoy doing the meetup, um, and it's a lot of fun, but we've never actually recruited a single person on the basis of having done that meetup group. Um, what we also see on, on our side, on, on hiring, I can't agree there. <laughs> we have actually hired and met some people which are now working with us on our meetup. So. That was, was quite a good one. What was not working out for us was, or what I think is not working out is, the meetup is called Cloud Foundry User Group for the DACH region. So it's for the whole region of Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. And that region is too big for a meetup group. Mm -hmm. So I really recommend to do a meetup group local somewhere. I mean, Switzerland is local enough to just have one for the, for the whole country, but otherwise, just for the city, like you have with London focus there. Someone told me to have, um, in Seattle, there's two different areas. So there's Seattle, which is a lot of the startups and all the bigger companies are in downtown Seattle, but then there's also an east side, which is where uh, Microsoft and some of the Google offices are and different offices in general. And so they said, do every other month, do east side in Seattle and just alternate, but that people, we were, we were losing attendees. People that were in Seattle wouldn't come to the east side but the east side would come to Seattle, so we just ended up keeping it in Seattle proper after a while. Just creating twice as much work, huh? Exactly, the traffic and everything, so. Yeah, please, I'll, I'll repeat the question if you could say it as loud as you could, and then I'll repeat for the recording. I try my very best. So from a <coughs> attendee's perspective, the most annoying uh, sub uh, meetup is meetups without, without content or without subjects. So how let me then talk about uh, Cloud Foundry? This is really annoying. <laughs> Actually, for me, it's a complete waste of time. So please, if you organize a, a meetup, always check for some content, whatever. So the most annoying thing from an attendee perspective is a meetup with no content. So please have good content. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other advice? He doesn't or? have any opinions at all. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so at any time, if anyone has a question or a piece of input, yep. So I have a question for you for attending too often. Like you said, uh, you have regularly once a month, but you don't have the time to attend once a month because it's quite stressful. So, uh, so you see a very small number of people at once a month, and so you think that it's very good every second month. So the question is, can it be too often, and is once a month too often? Like, do you lose attendees that way? That's a good question. Um, 
it's a lot of work. Let me be clear. It's a lot of hard work to run it once a month. Um, the hardest thing is actually trying to find the speakers and just make sure that the content, to your point, is actually relevant, that people in the community care about it, that you're not just creating a slot and then having to fill it. Um, what I try to do, I do two things. What I do is I run one every month. Like I say, I don't do one in August because in Europe, everyone's on holiday in August. And I don't do one in December because it's Christmas and people are busy doing Christmas parties. So therefore, I do 10. I aim to do 10 a year. I do one, my November meetup, we typically do lightning talks. So we just have some fun. So we have maybe five or six speakers doing short talks and that's always quite a good fun event. And then for the other ones, it is difficult. I mean, you know, like I said, the challenge of trying to find speakers and you might get one, one event where you have, you know, a hundred people will show up because that particular content that you've got or that particular speaker that you managed to book, you know, is really popular and everyone wants to come. And then the next month, maybe you get 15 people come. But I, I look at it as, even though I find it hard work to do, it's also whether it's, it's kind of that, that principle of kind of the open space, it's like whoever comes that was the right number of people. So if you have an event and only five people come, well, those were the right five people. You know, they come, they talk, they network, they build that community. It doesn't really bother me that much whether I get 100 or five. If I've, if I've run it and they've come, that was kind of meant to be, so. So al along with that question, um, why, why do you, you know, Kim, why did you start the communities? Like what makes you passionate about it? And why do you think it's necessary to, or why do you think meetups are an important part of the Cloud Foundry outreach strategy? When I started it years ago, I was in sales. And so I was never one of those traditional people that had to have a sales engineer attached to me all the time. I always wanted to understand the technology. And so when I started helping out with Spring and then I started uh, the Hadoop user group in Atlanta, I wanted to understand the underlying technology, and so that was an easy way for me because I don't, I can read release notes, but it was easier for me to learn by hearing and doing and seeing uh, and having questions in a meetup environment. So if that's why I first start, got, I started doing it. For Cloud Foundry, um, you know, I feel like it's, a, it's such a positive community and why I stay in it, even though that's not my core focus at IBM, um, is because I love it, so. So we've kept you. Congratulations. <laughs> So Lucas, what, what, what makes you do it? Yeah, for, for me, it's really get to know new people and also get to, new, get to know new inputs. Also, I often think then when we see new concepts or discuss about new concepts, is this really the view that it can be? What do, others people, what do other people think about it? And really get that valuable input and have that discussion. Also, the, the upper and the beer discussions that are very great on that meetups, and that re really makes me passionate about doing it. I mean, I think with, with the meetup group that I do, um, like I say, because we are a platform as a service user group, some of the most interesting kind of meetups we have are where we invite basically kind of competition for Pivotal to come in and present, you know, what they're doing and what's interesting for those other companies. Um, and it's a it gives us an insight into kind of what else is going on. But, you know, Cloud Foundry is a community. And it, to me, it doesn't really matter whether it's, you know, Pivotal Cloud Foundry, whether it's IBM Bluemix, it doesn't really matter kind of the vendor. It's just interesting to hear other Cloud Foundry stories, how people are using it, you know, what's going on in the world of Cloud Foundry. And also, like, the other technologies like Kubernetes and Mesos and Docker. It's, it's just interesting to find out what's going on in our community, what people are interested in, have them come in, talk about it. And, and, and so a question that wasn't on my list of questions, so I apologize to you already. Uh, how long, when you started these communities, how long did it take before you kind of felt like you had a rhythm and you had a nice group of attendees that's coming? So what would your advice to someone who is starting one, like how long should they realize that it's gonna take before they really have a rhythm? I think it takes a little while. I mean, we started, my first year of doing Lopug, I think, we ran them probably only once, to the question of how frequent is too often, we only ran a meetup probably once every six months. And because it wasn't frequent and people didn't really know about it, we started off with only you know, 15 to 20 people. And now we have, I think, nearly 900 members in our user group. And I think you just have to, for me, the best advice would be just keep doing it. As long as you're enjoying it, as long as a few people come, as long as it's interesting to you, you know, it will just build up. It's just about keeping going, I think. 
Yeah, I think also for the beginning, it's very important that you co-organize with other meetups like Docker or Microsoft uh, microservice meetup groups in, in your town. And then the start, I think that was, was pretty easy on our side to, to get um, some attendees because you also get promoted from meetup.com for the first meetups and uh, others will get emails about there is a new group and they will automatically sign us, be some signups. But it's more important that what Paula, ma Paula mentioned, that you keep it going and really organize on a regular basis these meetups and search for the speakers, search for the venues, and keep that spirit going that is within that meetup group. Probably took us three or four months in Seattle to get repeatable attendees. Um, and a lot of it is, I'm super passionate about getting to know the people that come to the meetups and invite them back and remind, you know, not necessarily remind them, but say if they're on Twitter, they're like, hey, can't wait to see you next week. Hope you're going to make it. Um, but really, when we started having some pretty big high profile um, speakers, was when, you know, people really started coming and saying, oh, this is awesome. You know, and we're going to have someone that's more technical next week and not one of the original founders of Cloud Foundry. But, you know, join us, and so that really got a lot of uptick helping for us. I think it's also important to be kind of sensitive to the community. One of the things I try and do when I'm scheduling a meetup is just check the local meetup calendar, not try and compete with other meetup groups, not try and like schedule something on the same night as some other big event. And, and if you want to start up a meetup in your own you know, city or town where you live, maybe just see if there are already kind of a platform as a service user group or if there's a, a cloud foundry group. There's no point in kind of trying to compete if there's one already in existence maybe just contact the organizers see if you can contribute see if you can help not kind of try and form your new thing if there's already one you know you could support in your area yeah it's definitely a cardinal rule of meetups you know please don't split the community yeah and, and really do not hesitate to contact the organizers they're happy to to co-organize co something with you together So the we question is, um, what's the advice on level of content? Should you have frequent beginner level Cloud Foundry 101 classes, or should you do deep dives in the different Cloud Foundry aspects? What works well? We vary those. So um, for Atlanta, we're still getting that off the ground, even though we've been doing it for 2014, since 2014. So we do a lot of the frequent Cloud Foundry 101 things, because Atlanta was a little further behind Seattle. Seattle's you know, a lot of tech companies. so. I think it depends on your environment for sure. Um, but I do enjoy the deeper dive and we have had folks come in and do like mini workshops and we ask you to bring your laptops and we're gonna do these things. We're gonna actually show you how to work it. So that, that gets a lot of people coming back. I think, I think we do kind of similar to Kim, we try and mix it up. So sometimes we have the, um, like I said, we have different PaaS providers coming in and then you end up with a bit more kind of a vendor pitch and they'll talk to you about what their platform as a service will do, um, which can be interesting or less interesting, depending. Um, we've done different things as well. So like I say, we do a Lightning Talks event once every year, and that's always a lot of fun. So you get people to talk, and they'll talk about any subject. It doesn't have to be you know, technology related even. It can be on anything. Um, and they're always quite well attended. And then we've also run like a hackathon, which we've done on a Saturday, and people come in and they'll hack on a certain piece of Cloud Foundry. So we've done like a Diego hackathon which wasn't well attended, but was a lot of fun for those people that were there. So we try, we also try and mix it up. So the Denver, you want to follow up on that? Yeah, can I yeah. just like a quick follow up about the sort of commercial presentations or vendor pitches? Do you actively stop that? Or is there a level that that is acceptable? Or how, what do you feel about it? So the question is, what's your policy or attitude towards vendor presentations? I have a lot of opinions on this. <laughs> We are a community first. I work, happen to work for a company that actually has an opinionated take on Cloud Foundry. However, if you want to have that discussion after and someone wants to ask you about Pivotal Cloud Foundry or Bluemix, that's fine. But if you're coming in to do a straight up vendor pitch, that's not what the meetup's about. Yeah, as I've seen the same, we also had some 
real vendor pitches. And after that, I started to review the talks and <laughs> review the slides up front, just to go a little shortly about, I mean, one slide about what, what they do, no worries. On, at the beers, there's enough time to pitch it, for sure. But yeah, it's not a place for a full sales talk. So on the, on the content side, the Denver user group usually does two presentations every night. And so the first one will be a talk, like I, I gave like a, cl a Cloud Foundry Foundation update. I know like all states come in and Digital Globes come in to talk about how they use, not vendor pitches, but like actually how they implemented Cloud Foundry. And they're quite honest about what's working and not working. So that, that goes over really well. And then their second talk is always a very technical talk by someone from the Cloud Foundry contributor team talking about what they did. So they kind of balance it every meeting. We tend to kind of invite people and if they do a vendor pitch it's sort of at their own risk because <laughs> we quite typically have colin humphreys who's our co-organizer and he will heckle and he will ask <laughs> awkward questions so vendors want to come in and do their kind of competitor to cloud foundry pitch that's absolutely fine but it's sort of at their own risk let's put it that way <laughs> that's one way to do it <laughs> so so we've talked a lot about content what's been so everyone who organizes a meetup is always looking for speakers and contents. And I'll put up a mailing list. We have a CF speakers at Cloud Foundry mailing list that you can actually post and say, I have this meetup, any of you interested in speaking. But I'm curious, what was your best, most engaged, best talk? Like, so everyone can mob them afterwards and send them email and ask them to come talk at their meetup. Josh McKinty. He talked about his journey from OpenStack and how he in, uh, into Cloud Foundry and how it all tied together. Um, and just because it's Josh, you know, a lot of people have wanted to meet him. That was a huge talk. The other thing, if you're talking about a technical talk, it was all, um, around containers. Um, and it was just talking about the entire ecosystem and we go from A to Z and how it plays into Cloud Foundry use cases for each one. And that was pretty well attended. Cool. Yeah, we had like half a year ago, we had Colin Humphreys um, <laughs> in Zurich and he talked on a retrospective on Cloud Foundry. It was, that was pretty good. I really recommend him. <laughs> I think uh, I'll, I'll go apologize to Josh and Colin later. <laughs> <laughs> I think probably our most well attended meetup has actually been when we've done the lightning talks, mm -hmm. because when you've got kind of six different speakers from six different companies and they all invite their friends and their colleagues and they all come in. And because there's typically what we've tried to do when we've done that event is have something for everyone it then seems to attract a wider audience and then you get lots lots more people come and you know, I think that's, that's always been our most well-attended event. Cool. Any questions from the audience? On the format of the lightning talk session, like how many speakers will you have and how long would it be for? So what's the format of the lightning talks? How many speakers and how long? So we try to do between five and six speakers and depending on the number of people, so we, our, sort of our total session time would be, let's say, an hour. But what we would normally do is try and have, let's say, three, and then a quick break so everyone can get more drinks and more food, and then another three talks. Each lightning talk would be five minutes. We typically get them, they maybe have one minute spare, and then it's off the stage. So, um, but we're not strict, when we do it, we're not strict on, you know, you can only have each slide every 15 seconds. We don't have any kind of format like that. You can have as many slides as you want, but you get five minutes, and that's it. Neither. Yeah. Um, do you do anything? So I'm just getting started running meetups, and I'm quite keen to get them more diverse. So do you have any things you do to promote diversity for speakers and attendees? How do you promote diversity of speaker and attendees? Um, posting with other groups. Um, in Seattle, there's women in tech groups there's, that I'm involved in. There's also different uh, startup groups that I'm involved in that tend to have more diversity. And so that's, that's worked well in the past for us. Yeah, I often go directly to, to people and ask them and encourage them to speak at the meetup, give them the platform and have them to talk about what they're doing. So we, I've done something similar to Lucas. So we've, um, particularly the lightning talks, we try to encourage people that have not spoken before um, because if, you've, if you're not used to public speaking, that five minute slot is slightly less scary than a 20 minute slot or a 30 minute slot. And so we actually had a, a really good case, I think it was two years ago when we ran it, we approached somebody who was in Pivotal to come and do a, a lightning talk and she was very nervous, she'd not spoken before 
And then since then, she's gone on to speak at lots of different conferences all around the world. And she's fantastic. And she came back recently and did a half an hour talk at our meetup group. And it was amazing. Her confidence had built so much. And just from doing that one five minute lightning talk, she's gone on and spoken kind of all around the world. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Any advice from the audience on, on any of these topics? Or anything you want to say? Any questions? I always have lots of questions. So I can go back to my questions. My, my other thought on the, on, the, on the paid talks, though, is that nobody wants to give a talk that nobody wants to listen to. So I, I think being really blunt with people and saying, you know, great that you sponsor this thing, people will notice that. But if you stand up and give a product pitch, they won't remember you well. Um, so we asked how you found speakers. Um, and what are the signs that your community is doing well? Like, how do you know? Like, so you started up this meetup, it took three months to a year to get it really going. How did you know then that it was going well? Like, is it the number of attendees? Is it the conversations you have? I think for me, it's when you see kind of similar faces and you see the regulars that come. I mean, it's, it's always great to see new people come, but we've had a couple of cases where people have come to our meetup, they've gotten to know each other, and in actual fact have then gone on to kind of form companies together so we've had a couple of kind of startup companies that have basically been built out of they've gotten to know each other because they've come to the to our meetup they've got a shared love for cloud foundry they have ideas about what they want to do with it and so they're going to go off and start a business from it and i think to see that kind of growth out of just our meetup group to me is a really great measure of success like it looks like it's doing well because people are kind of getting together outside of our meetup group and starting companies <laughs> yeah, that's a huge thing. The number of attendees, yeah, that's always an indicator for sure. But as Paula said, the regularly, the regularity, and if you see the same people returning to your meetup, have the conversations, and then, yeah, you can also build up some trust. You see their loyalty. This really is for me a good sign for a healthy community. What makes me happy is when attendees become speakers, you know, and that that's always a sign of a super engaged, you know, community that's happening. And then when everyone, when we have to leave the, the space and they're closing it down and everyone wants to grab beer after, you know, that's how you know it, it you know, we've got a good little ecosystem going. Cool. Yes, that then always when the beer starts, not people just taking one beer and they left. We're often there for hours and just yeah. talking exactly. and having discussions. <laughs> yep. Right here in the front. So what's your meetup? Which meetup do you run? Uh, I run the Nijmegen PHP meetup okay. and the WordPress meetup Nijmegen. Cool. So it's going to be something like this. And so you said, for, for the back of the room that might not hear, that the most important part of your meetup is the, is the social, social aspect of it. And so the content is to get the conversation going. Exactly. Yeah. And we get so many people connecting through that video. It, that's the awesome part. It's what gives me the energy. Cool. Thanks. So do you run any analytics on your attendees? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I typically, uh, I like to kind of, in the run up to it, I like to like look at the numbers. I get quite excited if I see there's lots of people signing up. Um, I kind of ask people to sign in just so I know how many people are in the building in case we have to evacuate. But I don't use it as a kind of a... I don't ask for people's email addresses. I don't try and market to them. I don't try and hit them up for kind of information. Um, it's about just having that community of people can come and chat and, you know, like you said, have the sort of social content. I don't tend to, personally, I don't tend to do any analysis on who's coming or from which companies or, you know, that type of thing. Not really. Anybody else? Any analytics? 
Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. I go through the list um, right as you're about to have the meetup. The list kind of populates and it shows how many times they've RSVP'd on the website when their first time they've they said they were coming. And then you can, can kind of go through and kind of see what the trends are. Mm -hmm. But as far as I'm a huge proponent of if, if someone from an organization inside of the company were to say, I want your meetup list because we're sponsoring this. And oh, by the way, we're going to use this as a as a tool to try to sell to these people. I, I would shut it down. <laughs> I would just like burn it to the ground. <laughs> because that's not what people are there for, right? They're not there to be sold to. You know your audience, basically. And then these people are, are passionate about the technology or want to or know more. And so that's, you know, that's the intent. So you got to keep that. You got to keep that like that. And, and we'll just take a couple more questions to wrap up. Um, but what's one thing that either someone told you wouldn't, didn't, wouldn't work or that you didn't realize would work that you accidentally ended up doing? Like, what, what surprised you that worked? Someone said to me that you should, as Kim mentioned earlier, that you should move location regularly so that, you know, if you've got people, I mean, London probably doesn't have quite such a split as maybe Seattle, but you know, someone said you should go for different locations so that it doesn't look like you're always based in one company's office or you know, that you're heavily influenced by one company, et cetera, et cetera. That was the worst advice, I think, ever, because it felt like if we changed location, people then weren't quite sure where we were and they had to keep checking on the site and then people would kind of go to the wrong place. And I was like, that's actually crazy. So we now consistently run it in the pivotal office, uh, and people know where it is, and they don't get lost, and they show up, and it's just much more straightforward. We should go back to the people that gave you both the same bad advice and like tell them. <laughs> 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 Anything else that surprised you that was a success that, that you didn't expect or that someone told you wouldn't work? For us, yeah. um, we changed, as we are mainly Zurich focused, that we have our meetups in Zurich, and then once in a while we yeah, we were told, yeah, do something in Bern. That's about one hour train. It's the distance. same bad advice. <laughs> 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 Looks like. <laughs> but then there, actually, I didn't um, thought that it would really happen, but we had 30 attendees out of, out of nothing, and it was um, really spontaneous defined there. So it really surprised us. To oh, so that it, you were successful in the second city it was, in Bern. It was successful there, yeah. So now we, we as of now, check where, what the availability of the venue is. And based on that, we then, cool. or where the speakers are from, or how it works for us. Cool. But, hey. but also then, we do not change. We have like our three locations and change maybe between these three locations, but do not have always a different location. I do think it's worth pointing out that you can get all the advice, you should get all the advice you can, um, you should find out what's been successful, there's a lot of commonalities, but every community is very different. Like, you, you can even look, if you did have access to the meetup analytics, you could see that the number of people that RSVP and attend the meetup, like the percentage of RSVPs that attend varies greatly by country. Um, there's just different cultures on whether or not you really come if you say you were coming. Um, I think the U.S. is one of the worst. So, um, yeah. so it, there there are differences between locations and between communities. So take take all the advice and then look. The, in one case, it was bad advice, and in one case, it was really good advice. Yeah. Have you ever, I mean, have you ever considered uh, asking for a fee? Have you ever considered asking for a fee? So we split the costs. Uh, Pivotal in Seattle and Atlanta, uh, and Atlanta too. We split the cost. So they host it. Um, and then they provide beer, we provide the food, but I'm also sourcing speakers. <coughs> and so um, as far as the fee goes, we don't really charge our attendees. We would rather pay that ourselves because we don't want you to have to pay to go to something. However, it w uh, there's a, a psychological thing that's the study that if you pay a nominal fee, more people will show up. So maybe we should do that in the, in the United States because it is flaky. It's, it's flaky. about half, uh -huh. you know. I'd say it's probably about half. In so the UK in the as well. I mean, it's yeah. normally if I see, let's say, 50 people have signed up, I expect, yeah, 25 to 30, depending on the weather. If it's a beautiful day in London, nobody will show up. That's like I, it's, I know yeah. that. Yes, yeah, so Stormy, <laughs> Stormy came and spoke at our low pug, and I think it was like the first warm, sunny day in London we'd had. It was like our first hint of summer. No one came. Like it was just so beautiful a day. It was like 
I think we had maybe 10 people. It was kind of quiet. Beer was yeah, don't take it personally, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right, so I want to wrap up with one final question. Um, so I would ask you normally, like, would you do it again? But I think it'd be more interesting to the audience. Like, what's the one piece of advice you'd give to them? Keeping in mind that a handful were meetup organizers and a lot of people were meetup attendees. What's your one, when it comes to meetups, like, what's the one thing they should do when they go to meetups? Or why should they go to a meetup? Or what should they bring to the table that would help the meetup organizer? What, one piece of advice to the audience um, in it, with any style that you would like. That's kind of your closing. Wow, no pressure. <laughs> um, I mean, for me personally, the reason I do it is because I like being part of the community. I like meeting new people. I like talking to people, you know, and I enjoy it. It's really hard work. I would say that if you're thinking of starting a meetup group, don't underestimate how much effort it is. It will take up your time. You will have some sleepless nights where a speaker will drop out at the last minute and you suddenly have a gap and you've got 100 people signed up and how do you get that new speaker to come in at the last minute? Like Those things happen. But you know, I enjoy it. But honestly, I really enjoy it. That's why I do it. And I think if anyone's thinking of starting a meetup group, think about it. And then if you're passionate enough and it's something you really think you'll get some benefit out of, I would recommend go ahead and do it. Yeah, for, for me personally, it's really if you go to a meetup, do not, really do not hesitate to share your thoughts. I mean, nothing is wrong. Just open up the discussion, share your thoughts. That's, that's really the real value that I see. If you're an attendee and you're getting to know the project or you're starting to play around with it, offer to be a speaker because there are no dumb questions. We're all in this learning together. Um, and if you want to give the one-on-one -on -one level talk, and maybe you attended the first one four months ago, but you've been really deep in it, submit it. Um, you know that that's super helpful for all of us. Like after doing it for so many years, I told Stormy I wouldn't be negative up here, but I'm burnt out at trying <laughs> to find speakers. So also, if you have people that you know that would like to come speak in the states, let me know and and let Stormy know. I mean, they're keeping lists. So. Thank you, Paula, Lucas, and Kim, and our whole audience. And they, they are here all week, and they're all Cloud Foundry ambassadors, and you can interrupt them. You can come up to them, have a drink with them, have a coffee, have a water, ask them your questions, tell them your opinions. Um, we're here to help make this community awesome, as all of you are. Um, so please start the conversations. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.